Welcome to the Short Circuit. I'm your host, Daryl Willis, Corporate Vice President of Energy and Resources at Microsoft. And I'm excited to have you join us as we dive into critical challenges and trends surrounding the energy transition. In each episode of the Short Circuit, we'll hear from industry experts and industry leaders who share their insights and perspectives on the current state and future state of the energy sector. Today, we have an exceptional guest with us, Deputy Secretary David Turk from the U.S. Department of Energy. David has held several key roles in the U.S. government over the last 20 years with the Biden administration, as well as the Obama administration. He was also Deputy Executive Director and Head of Energy Environment Division at the IEA prior to joining the Biden administration. Welcome and thank you for joining us, David. Thank you for taking some time to talk to me and uh, uh, me on behalf of our entire workforce here at the Department of Energy in the U.S. government. It's just a pleasure to be with you and uh, eager for this conversation. So, David, before we dive into a deeper discussion around the energy industry and the global energy transition that's underway, I'd love for you to spend a few moments just talking a bit about your background, your time in government and your time with the International Energy Agency. So uh, I feel incredibly fortunate to be in this position. Uh, it is a golden moment for our U.S. Department of Energy with all these new tools and funding streams that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, from the historic Congress and the president's leadership. Um, I've had a pretty eclectic background. Um, my wife uh, teases me sometimes that I've sort of switched jobs every three to four years in my career, uh, but I've had some really interesting opportunities. Uh, I worked in Congress uh, for a couple of different senators and then the House of Representatives earlier in my career. I had a chance to work more on national security issues at the State Department a couple of times and the National Security Council, and then really uh, wanted to devote my career uh, and my professional life to helping on climate change and clean energy. So I've had some remarkable opportunities. This is my second time at the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. And then, as you mentioned, I also had a chance to work at uh, what I consider just a phenomenal international organization, the International Energy Agency, and was really brought on board there and worked there for four plus years to try to help strengthen what the IEA uh, brings to the table in terms of clean energy transitions and working with countries and working with companies to help them execute on their transitions uh, to do what we need to do from the climate side. Fantastic. And I can definitely relate to what you said about moving every two or three years, because in a previous life, I worked in the oil and gas industry. And over the course of about, of about 30 years, David, I moved 14 times. So uh, that business of moving every two to three years uh, truly resonates with me and bring back, brings back lots of memories. So uh, thank you for that. My team here at Microsoft and I really, really focused on helping the world with this complex, uh, what we call this energy, this trilemma around energy, around access, around security, around sustainability, and also grappling with the fact that energy demand over the course of the next 20 or 30 years is going to increase by almost 50 percent. We're also seeing the increase in the electrification of everything and growers, growing disruptions associated with weather are uh, placing all kinds of new and uh, challenging demands on the power grid. Uh, a, a grid that was built many, many decades ago, and we're demanding that it does a lot more today. I know that the DOE is uh, acutely focused on the future. We also heard about the $3.5 billion investment that's being made to strengthen the electric grid. And I'd love to hear from you around what some of the key initiatives are and opportunities for utilities and power companies resulting from this $3.5 billion investment. Well, I think the first thing we need to all appreciate, and those who've looked at the numbers and are trying to uh, do this energy transition, this clean energy transition in the real world, I think appreciate this, but maybe not all of our fellow Americans or uh, citizens uh, and fellow humans around the world. Uh, we've got a daunting, daunting task in front of all of us, right? Uh, we see what's happening with climate change, not only here in our country, but around the world. Uh, and science tells us it's only going to get worse. And so the question we have in front of us is, are we going to step up, do what we need to do? Uh, the goal the president, President Biden has put on the table, appropriately so, in my opinion, is to get to net zero by 2050. Now, 2050, uh, maybe for some of our younger listeners, seems like a long time off. But those who have been around, uh, it's only 26 years from now 
that is a few short decades uh, to not only decarbonize and get to net zero in electricity, which we're making some significant progress on, but we've got to have solutions for transportation. We've got to have solutions for industry. We've got to have solutions for all our built environment as well. So we've got an incredibly daunting challenge in front of us to accelerate a clean energy transition, to make sure we do it with affordability in mind, right? This has to work for all Americans and all folks around the world. Energy is a good thing. We want people to have energy. We want people to have the economic benefits from energy and affordable energy. We need to do it in a way that works from a security perspective as well, right? Uh, we spend a lot of time at the department thinking about critical minerals and making sure that we're taking care of these supply chains so that we don't have disruptions as we have more solar PV and more batteries and more EVs uh, on the market at, as well. And uh, when you look at the grid, just as you said, we're going to have some increases uh, in demand. We're also electrifying transportation. We're now up to in our country, uh, the latest numbers are 10 percent of our vehicles sold are electric vehicles. Uh, that is quadruple where we were when President Biden came into office. That is an increased electricity load. We've got more and more heat pumps, uh, efficient heat pumps, uh, carbon friendly heat pumps uh, on the market as well. And we've got to accelerate that even further. So we've got to be really smart about how we think about the grids, not just in terms of the generation, but using smart technology to uh, better uh, balance supply and demand, virtual power plants, smart demand response. There's something I'm particularly excited about, uh, but there's an awful lot of work to do in an awful lot of uh, uh, different sectors. One thing we realize at Microsoft is that we've all got a role to play in in delivering on this net zero ambition by 2050. One of the things I like to say, David, is that it's going to take all of us working together in concert with each other. So partnership becomes incredibly uh, it becomes incredibly important. What I'd love to do now is to talk a little bit about uh, digital technology and the role of digital technology. So this past summer, I had an opportunity to be uh, in California with uh, the CEO of PG&E, Patty Poppy, as well as the CEO of Snyder Electric, Annette Clayton. And uh, PG&E did something they'd never done before. They hosted an innovation day, which was uh, a big deal for a power and utility company to bring a lot of technology uh, thought leaders together to talk about innovation and how we're going to truly disrupt uh, the energy systems. And uh, what we announced with PG&E and uh, Schneider Electric was the uh, industry and industry uh, system, first of its kind, around DERMS. And it's all being built on Microsoft Azure. Um, the other thing I would say is that as a result of our engagement with uh, Annette and with uh, Patty, we are really thinking about how we can better help enable the, the, the power and utility sector in a more profound way. And so what I'd love to do is to get you to talk a little bit about how you see digital technology like uh, what we're doing with PG&E and, and uh, Snyder Electric. How do you see that supporting the modernization of uh, the much needed modernization of the grid? So I think it's absolutely critical um, to fully leverage digital technologies to help on the grid, but help on a variety of other sectors uh, as well. Um, one of the pieces of analysis that we put out recently that has gotten an awful lot of attention are what we call uh, liftoff reports, looking at key technology areas and what's required to make sure that those technologies are playing their role uh, in this clean energy transition and being leveraged not just in an academic environment or a lab environment, but out in the real world by companies, by entrepreneurs, by businesses, so that we can take advantage of uh, the full range of technological solutions uh, out there. One of those reports that I'd encourage your listeners to take a look at that I'm particularly excited about in this liftoff series is on virtual power plants mm. and really thinking about the supply, the demand, how do we balance the grids, how do we use technologies uh, to uh, make sure we're being smart about this. So uh, for those who aren't experts uh, in this space, and I suspect we may have some who are experts in this space, uh, is we have more and more renewables coming onto our grid. That's a good thing. Uh, the fact that we've had the solar numbers we have had over the last several years, they've increased significantly wind and now offshore wind in the US, uh, which is just terrific. And we're bringing some batteries uh, and other storage uh, onto the equation. But we can do an awful lot by making sure we're balancing supply and demand, being smart about our demand response, right? Uh, if you've got an electric vehicle and you've got some flexibility, whether you time it in the early evening versus overnight, let's do that at a point where we've got a uh, more renewable resource. So we're balancing and doing what they call peak shaving 
uh, in terms of off the uh, off the demand uh, side of things. This liftoff report on virtual power plant was quite interesting in a number of ways. One thing it pointed out is we are having more and more mobile batteries out in our world, in our country. Again, 10% of our vehicles sold now are EVs. That number will increase. We'll have an awful lot of uh, mobile batteries that uh, have some flexibility about when they charge and when they don't charge. And then what's particularly exciting is uh, if you have two-way charging, you can actually use those batteries to help balance the grid when you really need it, uh, whether in extremely hot times or cold times or other times when you need to have that uh, balancing. And there's very sophisticated software technology. Uh, AI can certainly be helpful about having smart grids so that we can get more out of the generation resources we have and do it all a lot more efficiently. Um, and so I think there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, utilities and utility CEOs that are generally pretty uh, conservative creatures, right? Like they get yes. fired if the lights go out right. or if something bad happens. And this is where we spend a lot of time with our national laboratories, working with utilities, increasing their comfort level, using these new technologies so that they can get the job done better, uh, more affordably for their customers, uh, but deliver the services with the reliability that we all uh, demand and depend upon. But there's a way we can do this. We're smart enough to step up and take advantage of, uh, of these uh, opportunities. Fantastic. So, David, are there ways that we as a, uh, a technology provider like a Microsoft, are there ways that we can better engage with the uh, Department of Energy and other government groups and policymakers to support a lot of the critical initiatives that are underway? Yeah, the, the thing I really raise is, and again, I'm not sure people have fully appreciated uh, the scale of what we're trying to do, not only from a U.S. government perspective, but from a U.S. society perspective right now under President Biden's leadership. So just at the Department of Energy, the pieces of legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, uh, gave our department $100 billion, 70 new programs, uh, not just the one you mentioned on the grid, but all sorts of other ones. Uh, for instance, $7 billion to build out clean hydrogen hubs in our country. Another billion dollars on top of that to have a creative demand uh, stimulation uh, effort on clean hydrogen. But we've got literally funding streams, grant programs. We've got our loan program. Our loan program was instrumental in early days of Tesla to get it off, off the ground. Uh, we're now ramping up that loan program. We've got a couple hundred billion dollars, 200 different applications to the loan program, just to give you a bit of a sense of scale. Uh, all of these funding opportunities, whether loans, whether grants, and we're working with our Treasury Department colleagues on all the tax incentives across the board uh, in terms of what we're trying to do to incent uh, and really get this clean energy transition uh, uh, out there at pace, uh, at scale. Uh, another data point I like to use is we've actually had to hire up uh, 900 plus new people to staff all these programs mm -hmm. to make sure that we've got the talent in the government uh, who is aware of and coming from private sector, uh, coming from investors, so that we can be really smart about leveraging the tools that we do have for real world impact. And real world impact is uh, uh, helping to support entrepreneurs, helping to support companies, helping to support consortiums of companies to step up and accelerate this clean energy uh, transition. But what we need first and foremost is an intensive dialogue and back and forth, right? Uh, we're not gonna just be able to sit here in DC as smart as our folks are, and we've got some incredibly uh, smart folks in the Department of Energy in our national labs, but we need that guidance. We need that feedback from the private sector. We need those course corrections. We need that vector change all along if we're gonna be smart about leveraging these tools uh, in order to really achieve our, uh, our, our shared objectives. So we need to have what I like to call an extreme public-private, private-public partnership uh, here. I think that's what, uh, that's what the times demand. That's 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 exactly right, David. It's all about partnership. And for me, um, having spent more than half my life in the energy sector, I am really uh, I was really excited to hear Secretary Granholm at Zero Week in March of uh, last year. She spoke, and it was great to hear kind of how she's leaning in that DOE DOE would help from you and what the administration's doing. I also know how important energy is to everything we do. It is essential. It is a great uh, liberator and equalizer and anything we can do to provide affordable, safe, reliable, 
uh, accessible energy. Clean energy is is incredibly uh, it's something I'm incredibly passionate about and excited about. And Microsoft is as well. What I would love to do is end with a a, 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 a little bit of a different question. I'd love to, in closing, ask you um, as you look ahead from a personal and professional level. What are you most excited about when you think about what's in front of us in regards to energy and the energy transition? Well, what I get most excited about, I got to say, Daryl, is I, I mentioned these new 900 new colleagues who've come in. It's part of what we call our clean energy core. It's some folks who are just starting out their career. It's others who are making a mid-career adjustment. But the enthusiasm of them, given the, you know, we talked earlier about the scale of the challenge in front of us to get to net zero in just that 26-year period of time, that is daunting. Uh, but it's also exciting. There's so much opportunity there. There's opportunity for folks to make careers in this space. Maybe it's on energy efficiency, maybe it's on solar, maybe it's on geothermal, maybe it's on fusion, uh, maybe it's on the grid, and maybe it's on AI and leveraging that for permitting reform and to make our permitting uh, that much more streamlined. There's so many opportunities for people to do good in the world, not just working in government, but working in the private sector and entrepreneurs. And what I'd really like people to do, going back to our earlier conversation is, Great to work in the private sector for a few years, come work yeah. in the government for a few years, and then go back to the private sector, and then go to a nonprofit and go to an advocacy group, get those different perspectives, all part of this shared journey to um, really make some progress together. So uh, it is a daunting proposition to get to where we need to go, but that offers up a huge, huge range of opportunities for people to make a real difference in their career choices, to really step up, to hold each other accountable, not just to talk in uh, abstract terms or in theoretical terms or to put out targets, but have no way to get to them. Let's roll up the sleeves and get to work and get this done uh, working together. And that's really right. exciting. I think that's the thing that makes me the most excited. That's exciting and and, and there's plenty of work to do and uh, that's a great invitation for folks to think about making transitions from public to private uh, work uh, and advocacy as well. Uh, Deputy Secretary Turk, David, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today for this episode of The Short Circuit. Um, we appreciate the insights, the perspectives that you shared. I know, we know that you're incredibly busy, and so we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. And to our audience, I'd like to say thank you for listening. And until next time, uh, we'll see you then, and we'll continue to talk about hot topics and unpack hot, unpack hot topics and trends around the energy transition. Thanks, everyone. And David, thank you so much. Thanks, Daryl. Great to be with you. Thank you.